Well, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the April 13th edition of Bull Sessions. My name is Mark Robertson. I'm joined here by uh, uh, our free-ranging Ken Kavula. Good afternoon, Ken. Good afternoon, Mark. Uh huh. Just playing coming to you from coming to you from Central Virginia, just north of, uh, just south of uh, uh, Washington D.C., north of Richmond. Did you? So we're on a hot spot. The, so we'll see how long it lasts. Huh? Did you have a lovely cruise through the mountains? Uh, it was the Pennsylvania Turnpike, and then right down uh, the western side of Washington D.C. So there. There were some mountains, but it it wasn't particularly delightful. Uh, you should come it's back. It's not by like way a of, lot of beautiful mountain trips. Come back by way of Marietta. We we like the the road through Beckley, West Virginia, and then through Marietta, Ohio, much 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 more. But it's an hour and a half longer, so uh, yeah. you'll have to weigh those two things. All right, we're also joined here by Kim Butcher. Good afternoon, Kim. Hi guys, how are you doing? Good. I mean, and, and we're just sharing with basically Ken is on spring break. That is not him on the left with his backpack, but it, I suppose it could be. And we are going to talk about the Masters briefly, a little bit about a book by the name of Range and this notion of generalists versus specialists. And uh, that'll lead us into a quick discussion of Kathy Wood and ARC Investments and the Innovation Exchange Traded Fund specifically. So, Let's go ahead and get rolling. You guys all know the drill. I see a lot of familiar faces. Welcome back. If you're joining us for the first time, uh, extra big welcome to you. Uh, just a reminder that no investment recommendation whatsoever is intended. This is all about education uh, with the emphasis on the word demonstration of the philosophies, methods, techniques, uh, things like stock analysis, stock discovery, um, portfolio design and management, all that kind of stuff as promulgated by the Modern Investment Club movement. Uh, any opinions that we express are our own. Please take them as opinions or as a seed for further study. We do try to disclose if we own a stake in the company that we discuss. We do a monthly program on the last two, Thursday, excuse me, Tuesday of every month, 8.30 Eastern time called the Roundtable. We're coming up on our 11th year of doing that monthly program, and uh, the tracking portfolio has a, a really nice track record, checking in at about 18% per year. Um, if you'd like a reminder, if you'd like a reminder, if you have a friend or family member who would like a reminder about those roundtables, please send an email to nkabula1 at comcast.net. If you'd like copies of the slides, or if you have a follow-up question or suggestions for future topics, send me an email, markr at manifestinvesting.com. All right. Here's our ambitious agenda for this afternoon. Uh, again, we do these on Tuesdays at 2 and uh, can pretty much drift all over the place. We're going to do another Groundhog Challenge update, um, even though I'm not on the list. Do you want to talk about this notion of generalists and specialists a little bit? And then I thought we'd just spend just a moment talking about uh, a topic we brought up. It's hard to believe what it was a month ago, Ken, about trying to score non-core versus non -core versus core. And we'll just kind of dig into that. A couple of you submitted stock study requests for ChemEd and Viacom, so we'll take a look at that. And then you see the other topics that are in the bullpen that we'll eventually get to all the way down to the bottom of that book which I'm about a third of the way into, Layered Money. Uh, Kim, did you guys finish that book in your book club? We did. Okay. Would you recommend that I finish? I would. Yeah, I, I think we want to understand better. I mean, uh, in the green room, Nick, um, Nick D. actually pointed out that you could have doubled your money since 2017 in Bitcoin. So I think we want to understand it and, and – uh, I'm just seeing a lot of people and noticing things like Tesla and I believe Morgan Stanley or one of the Morgan financial institutions went into it in a big way. So it, it is time to, to have, develop a little bit better understanding. It's probably past that time, but we can always uh, catch up as we'll probably talk about that too when it comes down to our book range. Any further comments, Ken or Kim? I'm just 
waiting with bated breath to see the next slide, Mark. Okay. <laughs> oh, now I'm anticipating. Woohoo! You, you free range warrior. Ah. All right. So the Masters concluded on Sunday afternoon. It was a, a good tournament, fun to watch. And uh, we actually experienced a moment. The first uh, Japanese participant won the Masters this year. His name is Hideki Matsuyama. And uh, the best investment that you could have possibly held on Monday morning would, would have been to own a golf business in Japan. Um, they're pretty crazy about golf over there. And he's going to become uh, probably what Satorahu O was to baseball. And it'll be kind of kind of fun to watch that. Um, one other thing that I wanted to point out was this was a seed that was planted many years ago. They actually created a subset of the Masters uh, designed and intended to nurture international competition. And Mr. Matsuyama actually won that version 10 years ago as an amateur. And uh, 10 years later, that uh, experiment, we'll talk about experimentation when we talk about range, that came home to roost with him actually winning. So good time. Ken, did you get a chance to watch or were you on the road? Uh, we were on the road. I did watch uh, some of the Saturday uh, sessions. Nothing on Sunday, but a little bit on Saturday. Uh, uh, I, there were some... <laughs> that course is just absolutely amazing. Uh, I don't think I would ever want to try to challenge it, but but the the views and the shots that they have to make and the size of some of those greens just... Uh, just boggle the mind when you sit there and you think to yourself what somebody is trying to do with a stick and a little white ball, you know? Well, the amazing thing to me is they stand there on the tee box and they look down what to me is a, a gun barrel that's lined with people. And there's no way I would avoid hitting those people. And well, <laughs> to me, the people would be just magnets, ball magnets. So. <laughs> All right. Pressing on. Just thought we would make that, mention of that moment passing um we did actually have a new leader in the groundhog for a few minutes uh ty hughes actually lapped joseph o'brien but uh joseph actually has recaptured the lead by eight hundred dollars so it's kind of fun to watch and again we just share this just so everybody knows where they're at in the the official standings nick di virgilio who checks in at number 13 i know he's with us because he's been uh commenting away in the green room um, Nick is moving right up the list. Good luck, Nick. And uh, again, there's, there's just a, a bunch of really neat names. My name is not on here. I, I suspect it will return. I do have, you know, means at my disposal to make that happen if I need to. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but Ken, does, yeah, Ken, you're moving up the list pretty well, too, at number 30. I'm happy to, to be there. I'm just checking how many knights are above me. And I think the, the path is clear now from 30 to the top, right? I, I think so. Although, uh, okay, <laughs> our combined entry is at number 22. So that's, Oh, well, then that, that's my next goal, I guess, then. Your, your, I, your, I do have the Baker, the Baker Model Club at 11 and the Mid-Michigan Model Club at 17. So oh, uh, those are both, both, you know, 14, 15%, nothing to sneeze at in the first four months of this year. So you're slow. Not actually four months, three months. February, March, April, yeah. Yeah, you're slow. as we always say, guys, it doesn't matter what happens the first three to four months. It matters <laughs> what happens at the end. That's true. It's always a, a quote that comes from somebody off the list, you know? Well, you know, <laughs> that's the only thing I can say. All right. All right, well, let's keep going. We visited this theme last week, and I just want to come back to it for a minute. One, in a mode of celebration, Tin Cup is that model portfolio we've been running to simulate a 401k since 1994. And uh, it's obviously done very well over the last year. Every transaction recorded at Manifest in our uh, communications. And uh, we basically made the point last week that uh, a mathematical trend line through those it makes it a little bit less uh, frothy. Uh, the blue dots are still above the black line, but they're not quite as big a deal as the previous slide. And then the Wilshire 5000 also checks in. And uh, somebody wrote to me and basically said that uh, 
the math seemed a little bit weak, so I just thought I would clarify. You know, with those trend lines, you're basically looking at what we know as that long-term trend of, of about 11%, you know, with a little bit of drift on the blue at the right-hand side. And uh, But I did want to make the point that this second picture really does issue a better reminder about the magnitude of the the Great Recession, 2008-2009. And then just the clarification that when you look at the long-term rate of return, the calculation for this, you do end up at 16% for the model portfolio, the demonstration portfolio versus 10 and a half for the stock market. So yeah, it has they have pretty much tracked each other la the last several years, but still the the blue one is um, going to be generally preferred by most most of us. Now, Mark, uh, wait, before you leave that, that graph, are, are these trend lines actually being drawn from 95 and then just we're just capturing the tail end of the graph? Or are these trend lines from 2004 to 2021? Uh, I have to confess, I mean, this is Microsoft simply slapping in a regression driven trend line. Um, so I'm not sure I am 99% uh, not sure, but 99% of me believes that they are just the data that is here. Okay, so that might might give a little bit of pause. Uh, and uh, it, it would be possible to show a graph from 95 to the end and make sure we get a trend line for that entire length. It's just that the graph would be a lot smaller then, right? Yeah, and I may do that sometime. Go back and actually grab it because I've got the, the monthly numbers all the way back to zero. So I'm yeah. going to do that sometime. But yeah, they both started it in the same place at zero. I, I'd like to see the difference because uh, we're getting a 10-year span now from the beginning to the beginning of this graph, or close to it at least. So I'd, I'd very much like to begin to see uh, if the first 10 years uh, is doing anything to upset the the more recent, uh, what is this, about a 15-year trend here, 15, 16-year uh, trend. So, yeah. Yeah, we'll take a look at it. I just wanted to make clear that that long-term rate of return is different than what, what is shown here in this. It's partial results. You're right, Ken. Okay. All right. All right. thought we'd talk just a moment about core versus non-core. Um, some of the people have been asking about it. We do cover it in our in our sessions. And Ken, would you like to discuss how we've switched the roundtable tracking portfolio a little bit for us? Well, we, we've always talked uh, from the very beginning of the roundtable, we've always talked about core stocks and non-core stocks. And uh, originally we tried to keep it kind of a, uh, of a little bit of a hazy idea. It never was fully defined uh, in the beginning of, of the better investing methods. Uh, Nicholson never sat down and said, uh, this is exactly what I mean by core, and this is exactly what I mean by, and he didn't call it non-core, he called it non-traditional. But uh, we, we originally, uh, you know, left it to the, the mind of the, the creator of the portfolio as to where they wanted to put uh, the two uh, types of stocks. But uh, we got more and more pushback from the, our, our attendees, our, our viewers, our friends. So we uh, decided to try to come up with a little bit of a definition of what kind of stocks uh, really were the ones that we considered core versus everything else, which we would consider non-core. Uh, that 70 to 80 percent comes from Nicholson. That's, you know, he said a, a fifth to a quarter uh, of your portfolio could be in these non-traditional, non-core stocks. So at least. 70 to 80 percent of your assets in in up straight and parallel core stocks uh, but uh, going uh, past this with any kind of a numerical definition or a, a definition of what to look for again it's it's kind of absent so uh, I guess uh, Mark and I are going to step into the void uh, Mark took the first step with a formula is that the next slide Mark let's go right to this there it is. Uh, he took the next step with a formula. He said, let's experiment a little bit. Uh, how about if we added the financial strength score plus the earning stability score plus the quality? And if it went 
somewhere greater than, and we pick kind of at random, although, uh, you know, this is an educated uh, judgment, not just a, a wild stab in the air, but an educated judgment said, uh, you know, 210 or 210-ish, 210 uh, somewhere above that would definitely be something that most of us would consider core, and something below that would definitely be something to be considered non-core. Uh, we added the proviso that it should have at least eight years history. And, and instead of putting the number eight there, we could have said, uh, and has experienced at least one recession, gone into the recession and then come back out alive on the other end of the recession. So uh, that's that's what that last little piece basically is talking about. Uh, yeah. Mark uh, suggested on the right hand side that that two ten could be as high as two and a quarter. Uh, so it's yeah, it's a it's little more still, scientific. Yeah, it's still a little little hazy. But uh, go on, pick pick. Uh, give us the direction that that developed the number in the first place, Mark. Yeah, I, I think all three of those components are just intuitively. Um, as it says in this paragraph up here, what we tend to think of as, you know, up straight and parallel, you want those type of blue chip companies with a track record and a solid, you know, field of opportunity, just everything kind of firing on, on all cylinders. And, and when you have that, you get this uh, combination score. Again, the, the, the stock price is not in here. This is all the, the fundamental characteristics. So what I did is I took the 2,500 companies that are in the database and added up those three criteria for all of them. And this is this is closer to my version of engineering. And what I discovered, the top quintile, the top 20% of all companies actually come in at 225, Ken. So that's that's beginning to feel more, uh, you know, more thought, more uh, nuanced to me. Uh, yeah, well, and it's it's also dovetailing really nicely with these original numbers that Nicholson talked about way back before we even had the ability to manage so many numbers in such a quick period of time. So, uh, you know, anytime we can move back to one of the most basic ideas that are coming from uh, from the founding of the association, I, I start to feel a little bit more on stable ground and. And I really think that this 210 number, and uh, you know, there'll be exceptions. We'll, we, we might find a company at 190 that we think is core, and we might find a company at, at 218 that we think is non-core. But for the most part, I think that 210 is gonna provide us with good clarity as to where the dividing line is. Mm -hmm. And then this extra proviso of making sure we have, uh, have allowed the company to experience a recession, uh, I think that's very important. I know how important you think it is too. I mean, we were having discussions two and three years ago about how the SSG uh, form itself uh, was too short uh, because we hadn't had a recession in some time. And so we had some, some great growth cyclical companies that were basically masquerading as plain old growth companies. So uh, this experiencing a recession is important to the whole scheme of things. And uh, luckily, well, maybe it's not lucky, but but the market has given us that kind of experience now twice in the last, uh, oh, what, maybe 11, 12 years. Uh, so that'll, that'll help with this concept of, of being around before and still being around after as well. Yep. And certainly putting a bump in a few of them. And then just as a reminder, we do break them down at the, the round table and you can see the two links to the two separate pieces of the round table. So uh, we'll cover that during future round tables. All right. Let's tr try out a kind of a new feature, Ken. I'm calling it duly diligent or DD. Um, Taking a look at a company uh, that could come from just about anywhere, including audience attendees, this one happened to come from Len Douglas. I'm sure Len is with us here today. And just the kind of stuff that we look at and uh, trust, audit, and verify when we go through a company. Now, ChemEd is actually the a combination company of a hospice service, 
which accounts for, I believe, 60% of their business, and the rest of their business is Roto-Rooter. Um, so it's, it's basically those two pieces, and you can see from the track record that it's got a fairly steady track record going back over the last uh, little more than a decade. And uh, we're basically talking about uh, a company that has a pretty, pretty decent top line uh, growth rate. What I find fascinating, what you see here is a side by side comparison of value line from early January versus the current value line, which has been modified a little bit. And let me tell you what I modified. I modified this 5% to match this 5% growth rate. You know, value line was at nine and a half. I think they came down to 8% in the most recent um, issue of the company report, but I have a hard time getting to, to nine, 10% for this company. 5% uh, is pretty comfortable and uh, pretty reliable. You can see that almost every dot is hit by that 5% trend line. So decent 13% margins. You can see that that's pretty consistent with the last few years. Um, uh, a PE of 23, uh, I think you can argue for that using this image down here. And uh, just noticing that that does deliver uh, kind of a vanilla projected annual return in that four to five range. And that's very consistent with this projected return on value. You're going to hear us talking much more about that. And we're going to get that added to the, the manifest displays very soon. And uh, no, the projected return on value is simply the, the projected pre-tax profit divided by the, the market cap, basically the stock price, plus the total liabilities, that's why you see it here, minus the cash. And uh, our experience has been that that basically lines up pretty closely or is, uh, resembles the projected annual return, Section 5 from a Stock Selection Guide. And uh, th this one certainly checks out pretty well. This company has no debt. Um, you can see the long-term return forecasts have been fairly subdued down here, down basically around zero right now. And uh, again, a fairly consistent situation. We also go on to show, uh, again, with a chronicle at Manifest Investing, you're looking at monthly snapshots of the stock price, which is the green bars, the, the blue line is the quality EKG, and you can see that that's certainly an, a nice trend. That's because of that improving profitability over time that's been creeping up, and the financial strength has, has been solid the entire time. And then you can see that the, the return forecast, again, this would be the Section 5 uh, result on a stock selection guide, uh, basically taking snapshots of that over time, and we actually had uh, a peak fairly recently following this price dip uh, about two, two and a half months ago that you see here in the six month uh, technical chart. And here's the long-term chart. So you can see that buying opportunity. It was a small buying opportunity, nothing major. Kind of a fascinating study all in all. When we look at a variety of things, the, the relative strength is, is right down the middle, uh, a little bit more uh, upside than downside, about two to one. And with that measure, Here's that confirmation of that low uh, long-term return forecast. And this is this is the thing that I wanted to point out with a company like ChemEd. Um, Morningstar thinks it's overpriced. In other words, the current price is at 470. They think the fair price for it is 396 and change. So Mor Morningstar thinks it's overpriced, yet the analyst consensus, which is I would lean more towards them in a, in a, in a cage match, they actually see the fair value is 650, which means that it's actually fairly attractive. And that's why you can see uh, distortions with some companies. So again, this gives you a, a front to back look at what other opinions are on the company. Um, pretty interesting stuff. Now, Len, I don't know if they had any other, anything you wanted to add to that. Ken, Ken, you might watch for a hand in the air, but uh, just gives you some some insight into some of the things that we look at fairly carefully at Manifest as we're looking over the, the companies that we track. Any comments, Ken? Well, uh, we're getting some questions. Uh, Nikki uh, says, uh, I thought ACE uh, was from Morningstar. Nikki, there's not a unique ACE number. 
when you use the SSG Plus in the Better Investing Tools, you do get a, a five-year call on uh, earnings. The, it is an ACE number, an analyst consensus estimate number, but I think it's a different group than the ACE number that Mark is referencing uh, on this particular table. Am I correct, Mark? Is this ACE coming from a different source? This analyst consensus estimate is put together by YCharts. I do know that it includes some Morningstar input but I, I'm pretty sure it's not exclusively Morningstar input. Yeah, we, we make the point uh, pretty uh, firmly in, in a lot of the classes we teach that every time you go to a different source and look at an ACE number, you're looking at a, a different group of analysts that may overlap in their makeup, uh, but, but probably there's a different number of analysts contributing to the to the number and definitely different personalities within that group contributing. So you would expect the number to be uh, different. Uh, I, I like to kind of watch when one or two of them ends up being way outside uh, the scope of things. Mark, I've been doing some uh, uh, preparing for classes recently and I wanna give you some anecdotal evidence that I've noticed from Morningstar in their analysis reports. Now, I've noticed it four times out of preparing six pretty deep dives into six different companies, but it's a, it, it's a push that I've never seen from Morningstar before, and yet I'm seeing it much more frequently uh, in the last six months, and that's the, the uh, not ability, that's the wrong word. It's the, the sense that they feel they have enough information uh, to make a long-term call on sales and or earnings and or margins or on, on more than a single one of those three quantities. And by long-term, I'm not talking about three, four, or five years. Uh, I'm talking about a 10-year or more call Mm. And, and I, I wonder if that's just foolhardy. Uh, I mean, I I already uh, have a lot of uh, thought going into how accurate our five-year calls. Uh, and uh, you and I both know that we're willing to, to move them around quite a bit as that five years progresses. But to make a call and to put down a number on, the, on a piece of paper especially when that number is into the tenths, uh, and then to label it as a 10-year call, I, I think is something that we should watch carefully. Uh, it sounds to me like, like somebody, uh, <laughs> I don't want to make any disparaging comments, so I'll stop there. <laughs> well, you know, you know, discretion uh, being the better part of valor, but, uh, but I, I just think that calls like that are way, way out there. Yeah, there's not many people going seven to 10 years out. And I, I, I think I stopped short of disparaging, but I did notice and in fact warned the audience about uh, what I see as some fairly abrupt and disruptive changes in the Morningstar fair values for a number of companies, including companies like GameStop. Um, uh, that have happened here in the last few weeks. It's it's a it's a discomforting uh, thing to watch as it's happening, and we'll certainly pay fairly close attention to it. This is the type of company that they well, and, and especially well. since it comes from such a trusted source, Mark. You know, and yeah. and we've always put Value Line, Morningstar, S and P. We've always put them on our list of trusted sources, and. And I would hate to be looking at a source that I've used for years and start to question whether or not the number is just way too aggressive sometimes. Yeah. Well, keep in mind, we've got S&P in the penalty box only with respect to fair values because they did get kind of crazy. The other thing yeah. that I wanted, wanted to point out was this is the type of uh, profitability profile looking at down here. This type of profitability profile can be quite challenging to the stock selection guide. And we've talked about it in the context of Church and Dwight. I'll actually put a link on the forum to that uh, discussion because you have to be willing to look out. And, you know, again, the, the, the highest it's ever been in terms of net margin for ChemEd is around 10%. And 
you know, notice that you've got uh, numbers in the 12, 13. Uh, in some cases, I've seen higher, like 14 or 15 percent. Um, those can be a tough call. So just be mindful of that. All right, so let's go ahead and take a quick look at Viacom CBS. It's a different story. Nikki actually brought this one. Um, this is a situation where, as you study the company, you uh, discover quite the step change between 2018 and 2019. That step changes the addition or the bolt on of CBS to Viacom. So that's what actually takes uh, and accounts for this. That's why we are not including these numbers here in our assessment of the situation. The only way that they are included is to note that you basically had a, a flat to negative growth in Viacom and, and basically tacked on CBS and ended up with a growth rate. Again, this 4% number is what you're seeing out here. So a 4% growth rate for the co combination company. Um, when it comes to the profitability, I'm only seeing 10 percentish based on this picture. Um, other people are looking for numbers like 14, 15% for this company. So uh, I'm having a little bit of trouble with that. I'm also not seeing the higher PEs, you know, since the combination. And again, some of that's going to be disruption, but I'm having a hard time getting back up into the mid teens and uh, would probably go with a little bit less. Even under those conditions, you do end up with a fairly decent uh, return forecast on section five. And that is consistent with the projected return on value of around 7%. So again, it's a fairly decent looking picture. This is a company that did get caught up in the short squeeze. So you gotta wonder if maybe uh, the turbulence that this company has gone through, notice that the relative strength index is down to where it's potentially oversold and uh, maybe a candidate for purchase and you see some fairly robust numbers down here. This one will be updated in two weeks with the next value line. I think it will be interesting to see and, and dovetailing with the comments you just made, Ken, might be interesting to see if Morningstar and or value line makes a bit of a step change in their expectations for the company. Here's the, the rest of that story. Um, again, it's only been a combination company for this amount of time. So you see an abbreviated chronicle only going back a couple of years and it's been quite a ride. Uh, this price chart doesn't do it justice. You can see the one down at the bottom we'll talk about in a minute. But again, numbers across the top, uh, that's a potential opportunity the way we look at things. Uh, we like to see an upside position 20% or less. And uh, these are pretty good numbers, 23% from Value Line, 70% from Morningstar. Uh, but I also want you to notice that, and again, this is a bigger influence out there. They still don't think it's on sale, the, the rhinos the larger herd of analysts tracking the company still think it's overpriced. So that's uh, that's an interesting place for them to be at. And uh, you can see that the, there was quite a run up. The six month chart here on the left featured a run up from the, the 30 range up to over a hundred. And you can see how uh, how that shapes up over time. There were a bunch of people betting against this company. This was one of the Reddit meme, that's M-E-M-E -E stocks. And uh, uh, anybody who bought it back uh, a year or six months ago had quite a run up. And uh, it's one of the reasons that we do like to try to stay at least mindful of relative strength indexes above 80, in some cases getting up to 90, and then thinking about you know, protective measures. Uh, I wouldn't consider this to be a core company, so I probably would have, if I owned it, I do not. If I owned it, I would have been uh, inclined to be fairly protective with this long run of uh, what some people would think of an overheated run that was fueled by a short squeeze. Your thoughts, Ken? Uh, I I just I just don't have very much to say about this stock, Mark. I, I don't feel that it's appropriate for the portfolios that I manage. I've never uh, really seriously considered it. And uh, I don't like the movement that's gone into it since it uh, it became a new company. I, I think that the trends appear to be going in the wrong direction in a lot of ways. Yep, I would agree. I think that there's, uh, and this is one that the rhinos seem to be uh, toying with a little bit. 
and they they can be harmful without without a doubt so again fairly fairly deep look i don't think i'd be inclined to go after it this would bother me a whole lot that uh this is still out there i'm not sure how much that can even be trusted but uh it is still out there all right so let's go ahead and talk about this book a little bit uh, i hope kim is still with us do you show her as muted or are you still with us kim i'm here all right, Kim, this is a book that you had suggested. I know I had read pieces of this excerpted someplace along the line, but uh, I, I really like, I'll, I'll just give you the thumbnail. I like the notion of that first quote about, you know, basically trying to be a, a generalist versus specializing in one skill. Um, my wife would second this mo no motion in that she doesn't allow me to use hand tools. Um, <laughs> Only when it's an experiment, usually outside the house and well away from the house, am I allowed to do that. And experimentation is a good thing. And I, th I think our community of investors is an embodiment of this notion of exchanging ideas. And uh, Nicholson referred to the modern investment club movement as an experiment, the grand experiment. And uh, again, I, I, I think, Ken, you've mentioned a few things about this, and I'll just let you guys kind of take it away, things that... Uh, we're going to link this up with Kathy Wood and ARC Investing here, and uh, she she tends to think a lot like we do. Your thoughts? Well, I'm really enjoying this book because um, the book talks about, and, and I'm in the first read the first three or first four chapters, and right now I'm really you know when you the Herd mentality will tell individual investors, you can't do as well as us. You should just let us manage your money. Well, if we did that, we'd uh, not have near the good returns that we do because we are more diligent with our managing our money because it's our money. And the other thing is, is uh, the herd has a tendency to put their blinders on and they think of things only one way. And this book talks about how individuals who've had a lot of experience in a lot of different areas. I'm going to just give an example of my investment club. We have a person who's from two people from the healthcare area, two people or one person who's from who's a metal urgulist, one of them who's from the banking sector, one's from the airline sector uh another one who's from computer area so we have a lot of different people with a lot of different specialties in their own way but together as a group we've done well with our investment portfolio and this book talks about that you can be much more successful if you're a generalist rather than being much more focused on one particular thing and that chapter that i really um they talked about a, a, a cha the chapter had a discussion of how music came about and the women musicians back in the 1800s, they all had to cross train on every single instrument because there wasn't that many of them and how they played so beautifully and no one expected it. And then people wanted to see who they were, what they looked like. And when that happened, everybody was like, oh a lot of the women had disabilities and no one thought that they could ever do well but they were doing well playing music and they were doing well playing many different in instruments yeah it was and fascinating they actually performed behind a, a kind of a curtain. screen curtain so you could see silhouettes and that uh, probably added to the the mystery and allure and uh come to find out that they were uh, ordinary looking, in some cases disabled, and people were taken aback by that. And I, I find it interesting that people, you know, discounted the fact that they'd been making this spectacular, fantastic music um, because of the appearance and they slipped into a different mindset. Well, it's just like everybody else, people, only think that financial advisors or people with PhD in economics or finance are going to be able to be successful investors. And what the book talks about is when um, there was a study done that talked about 
classically trained artist in music, no one could be able to, none of them were able to go out and play uh, improv, how's it? improv and jazz where they just went out there and did whatever because their brain synapses are all one path and only one path. They can't go outside of the ring. And so that flexible thinking is what really helps. And um, I know you and I, Mark, have talked about this, that your sister's a nurse and I'm a nurse. And sometimes, even as you said, Kim, where in the heck did Kim get this idea from? And I'm just thinking it's my nursing background that there's never just one reason of why something happens in the body. You got to look at about 20 other variables. And so it really means that those of us in this modern day investment club movement really do well because we can bounce things off each other. And that's really great for us in this community of manifest investing and better investing because we're getting a lot of views from other members that can give us their expertise. So I just, I, I'm really enjoying the book and um, it makes you think, especially kind of what you talk about of disruptive technology and those stocks. How do these people think of these things? Yeah. I, I mean, I never would have thought of some of the stuff that's going on. Yep. I think this actually ties into the core versus non-core also as we talk about this stuff. And Ken, I think this also uh, resemble some of the thoughts that you had as you started looking into Kathy Wood, including that that quote up at the top about having a five-year time horizon, consistent with what you had been saying about uh, her general philosophy and that sort of stuff. Well, I've, I've uh, had a lot of respect for uh, what she's been doing in the portfolios that she's put, been putting together for, for a reasonable amount of time, but I want to push back just a little bit uh, on different types of, of genius and different types of ability. Uh, and uh, I want to make the point that uh, a lot of genius and a lot of ability uh, rests in uh, formal knowledge, uh, rests in exposure to uh, things that uh, make up the core of whatever it is you're trying to learn. Uh, it might be true, and I haven't read the book yet, so I'm going to have to examine the quotes. Uh, it might be true that a classically trained musician uh, could not suddenly play in the style of uh, 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 Duke Ellington, for example. But I, I have to believe that most of the difference uh, would occur because they've not been exposed to the music of Duke Ellington. Uh, they also couldn't play in the style of Axl Rose. Uh, uh, and it's not because they couldn't do it, it's because they uh, couldn't understand the music because they haven't been exposed to it. And I, if you turn that around just a little bit, I, I doubt if some of the, uh, the great musicians to, of the jazz era or of today, for example, Wynton Marsalis, if I asked him, and, and he's kind of a, of a one-off because he does have a, a very uh, deep classical background, but if I asked him to play a tune in the style of Scarlatti, uh, I would hope to be able to stump him, not because he couldn't do it, but because he has no experience with, with the music of Scarlatti. So I'm thinking that, that it, it does take a formal knowledge base uh, to deal with a lot of these things. And then you have to be open to these flights of fancy. Uh, I've been worried about electrical cars for years, not so much from the standpoint that uh, we can't get an autonomous car to work uh, in Southern California uh, in a city uh, or almost anywhere else where the the sky is blue most of the time and the temperatures are high most of the time and uh, and you can uh, you know uh, do the 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 one-offs about weather uh, on the fingers of one hand and and let your cars run but uh, take that same car and put it on a road in uh, uh, in the middle of Michigan uh, in February when the snow's coming down and uh, when 
the paint on the roads has been scraped off by plows uh, <laughs> over the last uh, three or four months. And uh, when what is left is covered with heavy duty ice or slush, and I just I just bristle at what will those sensors be sensing uh, at that point in order to keep that car on the road. Uh, I think we're going to need a lot more to run those cars in a lot of places uh, than we're anticipating right now. I agree uh, with you, Ken. I think so, every every year know, it's pure Michigan. I think. Uh, Every year, Michiganders uh, provide a powerful reminder of how different and how challenging it is every year because it seems like we have to relearn to drive every year. Well, absolutely, and and I've just I've just thought on my trip from from Michigan to Virginia in the last two days about the number of times I had to readjust uh, because it's orange barrel season up here in the <laughs> north. Uh, yep. And there's barrels and, and things all over the place, and those barrels just walk right on top of those lines on the road, and they walk right on top of, uh, of a lot of uh, side markings and everything. Uh, you know, again, what are the sensors going to sense uh, during orange barrel season uh, in, the, in the north? Well, so you'd be, you'd be uh, careful I, while you're out there ranging around. Well, I just want to think a little bit more deeply, uh, uh, I, I agree with her that we're going to have to do AI and we're going to do battery powered technology. But, you know, I was I was pretty uh, firmly influenced by this Beyond Google book that we read. Yep, uh, yep. Uh, and and the idea that artificial intelligence really isn't so intelligent, uh, but it's just big. Uh, and uh, it just has the ability to go through uh, seven million uh, choices, you know, in a nanosecond and figure out which choice is best. That's not true intelligence. That's not bridging new ground and, and coming up with new reasoning. That's just repeating what somebody has already said at some point. Uh, and that's not going to take us much further. We're still going to need genius, and we're still going to need people that are are way, way uh, in a different plane of thinking than the average person is. And without them, AI will will grind to a halt. Uh, no matter how big the data is, without new thought, there's no real intelligence uh, that that will be expanding what we can do. That's enough from this soapbox. Let's get down off of it yeah, and move and on. Okay. I, I agree completely. I would just point out that I think what what ARC Investments does try to do is this notion of embracing generalists with different ways of thinking to, to try to cover some of that stuff that you're talking about. So I, let's let's go ahead and take a, a little deeper dive. One of the reasons that we, we do kind of obsess with them, they are the, the hottest fund out there. What you're looking at here is a list of approximately 10 years for most of these companies. Some have a track record slightly less than uh, 10 years. Uh, the Motley Fool entries and ARC Innovation actually started back in 2014. But over that time frame, comparing against the market, you can see that ARC, and the, the ticker for ARC Innovation's ARKK at the top there, um, has a relative return of 21%. That's nothing to sneeze at. So. Uh, it's, it's something that we would like to understand and certainly use as a source of ideas. We'll cover that in a minute. I did want to point out that Morgan Stanley has three prominent entries on this list, as does The Motley Fool, and Fidelity makes a pretty solid appearance with a, a number of these. These are the 20 uh, baskets of investments out there that have a relative return greater than 6% over the last 10 years right now. Yeah, we, we don't find very many that actually fall into that realm, so these are some good ones. And as always, we want to point out that if you aren't looking for the small and medium-sized companies in your portfolios, you're skipping out on this. That's why Ken and I spend so much time talking about smaller, faster-growing companies. you got to have them. All right, so let's take a, a quicker look, just a point to make that they do have a YouTube page, ARK Invest. And you can go take a look at this stuff. I actually spent some time this morning with their best ideas for 2021 and some of the stuff that Ken was talking about. And they do go into individual companies and that sort of thing. But this can be a, a useful resource to kind of tickle your gray matter a bit. 
this particular fund invests in the stuff that you see list, listed here. And it is right up Ken and Natalie's alley. Um, even though he was p preaching from that soapbox, he is a, a fan of finding and comprehending and investing in opportunity when it presents itself in a disruptive way. And uh, Ken was among the first people to point out Proto Lab. I think he probably beat Kathy Wood, Woods to that one. So good stuff there. All right, any comments on that, Ken? Nice idea. Nice place to look for ideas, Mark. Yep, they, they, their Maybe report. Some of these slides, Mark, need to go into our class for May about uh, uh, coming up with ideas on where to study. Yeah. yeah, I had that same exact thought. One of the classes that we're offering, you'll see here in a few minutes, is from topic or theme to targeting an investment. And uh, we'll probably start with a couple of the words on this slide and then see where we end up for that one. All right, I want to take you inside Manifest a little bit here. This is the ARC Innovation data that is pulled on a continuous basis for the fund. You see the, the top 25 holdings listed on the left-hand side here, along with the size of the, the amount that they actually hold in the fund. Notice that Tesla is almost 11% of this portfolio. Uh, ARC has been uh, in the Tesla camp for at least five years, almost six years now. And uh, they have a pretty good justification for what they believe to be the case. We covered that almost a year ago when uh, Hugh and I were talking about Tesla is not a car company. And uh, they, they basically drive that point home. Notice that the average growth, well, number of shares price, but the average growth does check in in that 25 range. That's exceptionally high. Um, but you can see we're talking about uh, lower earnings per share stability, lower quality, uh, lower financial strength. So again, we're talking about a non-core type, more speculative investment. But for me, it's a, a source of ideas to study and consider carefully. And in this case, I just wanted to demonstrate there are three companies that don't come up in the top 25. U happens to be Unity Software. That was just added to Value Line with the, the most recent update. So we've added it to Manifest. And the IOVA, which is a very, 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 very early stage biotech company. And this BE or KE Holdings, ticker BEKE, -E, they have been added to manifest and you can see some of the characteristics down here. So this- uh, Mark, you also gotta remember PLTR, I think it is, Planetar. Yeah, and it's, it's not among their top 25 I need to go and look. They actually only have about another 20. So uh, I can't believe it's not among their top 25, but it doesn't show up there yet. Yeah, Planeteer Technologies. That's that's a big data company, is my understanding. It, yeah, it takes, and to me, as I read it, and I went to the investor relations site and looked at some of the PowerPoints, this is taking all data and um, it's a data provider that tells you how you can get supply chain things done faster. And I think that's why they're getting all the contracts signed with the government and big business is recognizing it. It's not profitable yet, but I, I, I'm still trying to figure it out, but this would be a, ca uh, uh, not a capital intensive company, but a capital light company, because all they do is a whole bunch of computers and hire the scientists to program the computers. You know, it doesn't have to have a whole lot of infrastructure and, and you know, uh, what I call chemicals and all that kind of stuff. Yep. A lot of computers. I'm sure it's on page two. I'll, I will check into that. That is a company that we have looked at at Manifest. But just to give you a feel for you know where these come from and where these ideas can come from. Any thoughts, Ken? Mark, could I ask you to go back three slides or four slides, please? Tell me where to stop. One more right there. That one. And I just want I just want to tickle your uh, your creativity bone. Uh, wow. Is it a coincidence? Do you think 
that uh, about 25 or 30 percent of the top 20 uh, would end up being non-core if we were to place them uh, in the core based just on quality. Uh, just a, a, an open-ended question that I'm I'm asking. Yeah, and I I think it I think it dovetails with the theme, Ken, of being willing to you know consider outside up straight and parallel also that we've talked about from time to time this notion of the investment clubs we've worked with that didn't think they were allowed to invest in some point something more speculative and of course the answer is yes in moderation and you know under the right conditions um yeah but if I, i'm just kind of drawing a line at 50 and above and 50 and below uh you, you got a you got a fair number that are below but but only about 25 or 30 percent of them on the the list of 20 and it's just it just it strikes me as there's that number again that uh you know about 70 percent uh core about 30 percent non-core uh, there's that number again appearing on a list where i wouldn't expect to see it oh yeah i see what you're getting at now yeah so you you basically have a, a non-core slash core split right right in front yeah. of us yeah even even though a lot of this content on this page is going to be non-core. Right, right. But but, but I'm amazed, first of all, to how many of these 20 on this list come up with really high quality numbers. Yeah. Uh, that, that to me is amazing. And then uh, I, I don't see any as low a quality as I might expect, especially on a list of funds that are are you know are outperforming and doing really well. I don't see any of the the con aggregate quality down around 20 or or 18 or 22 or something like that. Yeah. So uh, bottom speculators. I, yeah, it's just very interesting to me uh, that that maybe uh, I want to do a little bit of thinking about in the back of my mind for a couple of months here. Yeah, and and for a for a fairly young person or a person with a long time horizon and a an appropriate risk tolerance, I have always looked at this one, VGT, excuse me, VGT, Vanguard Technology, very high quality, a little bit more subdued growth, and then QQQs. Um, we talked about QQQs a year ago and uh, invested in them and was really happy that we did. Okay. I think the other thing when I look at that, Mark, that's... That I think it's fascinating that you look at when these all started, March of 2011, right as we were coming out of the the buckle. Yeah, that just happens to be the 10 year time frame. So that's the the start of this period being measured. Many many of these started well before that. Okay. All right, so let's go ahead and wrap up with, uh, I did create a dashboard that you can check in on in a couple of days because these companies will fill in. And uh, one of the things that dashboards give you is also a worksheet because this number can't be right, or at least it needs to be examined very carefully. That's definitely a NMF, uh, and that's not profanity, Ken. <laughs> NMF. I got it, I got it. <laughs> That one's a little bit off the charts. And there's a couple more that uh, a lot of times what we find when we dig into these companies a little bit closer is that we use the projected return on value to condition these PEs. And uh, it's, it's something we will talk about in much greater detail in our future workshops and that sort of thing. But the PE is the thing that's kind of making these go haywire. So you can watch this dashboard. The, the link, public link is up at the top. And hopefully we'll get our funds all restored so you have these at your fingertips also. All right, so I'm showing about an hour in. Just wanted to, to make a pitch for, it's actually a month from now, uh, Successful Investing 3, also known as COVID Consolation Conference number 3. And you see some of the themes that we will be presenting to you. Again, small companies, faster growing companies. That notion of from theme to target, Ken and I will be trying to deploy some of the stuff we've even talked about here today. Portfolio management. Uh, Cy Lynch is going to do a presentation on what it means to, you know, stack the odds in your favor. Then we will have another 
distinguished stock panel with some people that have had some wonderful results in the past. So that's all part of the program. Anything you want to add to that, Ken? No, uh, my wife is working on publicity materials right now, and we hope that to have that first set of publicity materials out to our guest list within the week. So okay. uh, watch, your, watch your mailbox. We'll have dates. We'll have times. We'll even have links on where you can begin to register for one or for all five of the classes. Cool. All right. Just a reminder that we do have a Manifest Investing YouTube page. And I just made the point uh, previously that you can actually go back. Here are the sessions from a year ago. All of them are right there. So you can take a closer look at some of our screening techniques, small company stuff, which we'll be expanding upon. And yes, the stock panel from a year ago, which has uh, delivered some really nice results over time. So dig in and enjoy to your heart's content. And with that, I'll leave everybody with the serenity of Gig Harbor near Seattle, Washington, and our dear friend, Linda Klein. And uh, that picture was taken by Linda not so long ago, and uh, looks like a nice place to be. Ken, I think we need to go back. It is, and uh, my wife and I spent a lunch on a small restaurant that juts right out into the harbor, uh, and this view was right outside the, the window as we sat there and and munched away. It's a beautiful, beautiful little town. Very cool. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and say thanks, everybody, for showing up. Um, again, check out the YouTube, refer friends, give us your ideas for other topics or things that you want to hear about, and we greatly appreciate all of you. So with that, I'll say goodbye, and we'll uh, shut down for maybe a little bit of extended Q&A. But with Ken on the road, you never know. Take care, everybody.